Okay, so, uh, well, hello everybody. I'm happy to be there with you to speak about REST API design. Uh, there are quite a few topics uh, around REST API design. And um, there's not always one single way of doing things, and sometimes, you know, there's not necessarily a standard uh, associated with a certain topic, etc. So it's sometimes more about preferences than anything else. So I'll try to give you a different, uh, um, you know, alternatives, etc. And we'll try to cover quite a bit of things around the topic of REST API design. So why do I uh, speak about REST? Uh, so I'm usually more well known for Groovy. <laughs> Uh, because I've been uh, working on the Groovy programming language project for uh, more than 12 years. But pretty recently I joined a, a company called Restlet, uh, which is uh, focusing on APIs, web APIs. And uh, so I joined the, the company uh, last February, and we build projects and tools around the, the topic of web APIs. So seeing lots of APIs from our users and customers uh, give you, uh, that gives you some uh, ideas of uh, how to design REST APIs. So you can double check restlet.com if you're interested in, in what we're doing. And actually, during, if, if the network is working correctly, I'll try to do a, a demo of one of the projects, DHC, uh, but you'll see that later on if it works. So, uh, Roy Fielding uh, coined the, the term REST for a representational state transfer in, uh, in his uh, PhD thesis called Principal Design of the Modern Web Architecture. And uh, in this talk, uh, he defined different properties uh, your software architecture should have uh, to uh, be, uh, you know, compliant with the REST approach. So properties like performance, scalability, etc. So I won't actually you know, go through each, uh, but work uh, more around the, the different little topics around API design, ra rather than coming back to the, the whole principles of REST. But I just wanted to highlight, highlight them here as, a, as an introduction. So there are properties, and there are constraints. Uh, I mean, probably is, you know, who wouldn't be performant, scalable, and simple, and etc. That's, uh, that's cool. But it has uh, some, um, some impact on how you, you design uh, your, your APIs. And as well as uh, the constraints, like uh, the stateless uh, aspect or uh, certain operations uh, uh, where you can cache the results of uh, calls so that you can also improve the performance, even, even if only by the fact that you can cache some results. And we will perhaps focus a little bit more, a little bit more on the, the uniform interface aspect. Uh, so in REST, you identify resources, things that are actually important to your business domain. Uh, so let's say uh, I build an API for uh, the DevOps conference schedule. Uh, there are important concepts in my API, like you know the speakers, the, 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 the sessions, the agenda, the rooms, etc. So all these things should be somehow represented and identified thanks to resources, distinct resources. You also want to manipulate the, those resources and for um, viewing and uh, uh, creating your resources, you deal with representations. Uh, perhaps I can actually show the, the little bubbles. So for first resource uh, here, I can identify, let's say, a, a certain car, identified with the 123 ID. For the representations, well, I could represent that car uh, with a JSON payload, an XML payload, or why not a JPEG or GIF image for, uh, for that car. Self-descriptive messages, uh, it's also about things like uh, how you deal with those resources. You deal with them thanks to HTTP methods like get, post, put, delete, so that's the four most common ones, but there are other interesting ones like options, uh, patch, uh, head, etc. Well, there aren't that many, that's the most of them. And we will also, uh, near the end, speak a little bit about hypermedia. 
and how you can make your API more easily discoverable, more, uh, make it more navigable if you want to go from one resource to another. So let's say you're looking at a speaker and you want to see all the sessions that that speaker is uh, presenting. And uh, there are some approaches, uh, some, uh, if not standards, at least some, uh, uh, how, could, how could I call that, some, some uh, projects uh, to represent hypermedia links uh, between your resources. I was mentioning the four key methods, get, post, put, delete. So usually, you usually have two kind of resources. You've got a single item, so like a, a car, that's one individual single item, a car, but you also have lists of cars, a collections of cars. The operations on items and on collections are not necessarily doing the same thing, obviously. So let's have a look at the collections first. If you do a get on uh, the cars uh, resource, you're going to get the list of all those cars. Okay. If you do a post on that collection, you're going to add and create a new car. If you do a put, uh, well, usually putting uh, something on the collection itself, that's because you're replacing the entire collection of, uh, of cars. And if you do a delete, a delete operation, that's usually to delete everything. On the item, uh, you get cars one, two, three, four, you're going to retrieve one car. A post on a single car identified by an ID doesn't really mean something, so it's usually an error. Uh, but with put, you can replace or create an individual car. So instead of posting on the collection, you can do a put, and if you've got, uh, sometimes you can decide that IDs should be created by the client or provided by the API. If you do that, if you do a put on car slash one, two, three, four, that means that you want your car to actually have that specific ID. And then the delete operation is going to obviously delete uh, the, the car you're, you're pointing at. Basic stuff. Next uh, bit of uh, advice, uh, to be rest, restful, uh, you have to favor noons over verbs. So uh, there's a nice blog post uh, saying noons are good, verbs are bad. But so that's uh, kind of like uh, something you're going to say at a, at a protest. So usually prefer noons to verbs. Uh, noons really refer to resources, and verbs tend to refer to actions. Okay, but actions we said that we deal with actions thanks to the HTTP verbs. So noons are identifying your resources. So you would say in instead of doing uh, an uh, URI, URI uh, get speakers, you're going to say slash speakers, right? You don't put verbs. Uh, or retrieve list of speakers or something like that. You're not putting verbs, you're putting noons for uh, your resources. But actions are actually okay. There are some cases where you need uh, some actions and some verbs. So things like logging, logout operations or conversions, calculations, etc. You might uh, use verbs for that kind of stuff. And uh, the last example, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're browsing, uh, let's say, a repository on GitHub or some uh, project repository of some sort, you might, want, you might want to star that repository. So you can say repositories one, two, three. That's the, the, the repository I'm looking at. And then I, I say star because I want to star, add a star to that uh, repository. So it's okay. Well, star it perhaps is it's probably not well chosen in the sense that in English star is both a verb and a noun. But imagine um, vote or oh, no vote is a bad, another bad example. But imagine a verb which is not a noun. <laughs> it's not a name of something. Um, <laughs> can't find a like or like. Yeah, let's say I like that repository, so I'm gonna like it, and I would have slash like instead of star. Thank you <laughs> for this good suggestion. So noons are good, verbs are bad. And when speaking about noons, names, uh, naming, naming is also something which is important. Uh, there, there's been some debate. Well. Don't think it's really open anymore, but uh, some people like URLs of the form. So for the uh, individual uh, single item uh, URIs, prefer slash tickets, 
plural form, slash 234 versus slash ticket, no S, slash 234. Usually, uh, at least my, my experience with all the uh, APIs I've seen, is that uh, it's often less, con you know, less confusing to have just one single plural form, both for the collection and for the item. So it avoids confusion with words uh, which have a different kind of uh, spelling in a plural and singular form. So let's say person, people, goose, geese. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it can feel a bit weird to have different uh, uh, paths uh, for representing the, the same thing. Also, I mean, technically speaking, when you are working with your favorite uh, REST toolkit or web framework, etc., to implement your API, you might be uh, able to do a routing based on the on the prefix, and uh, uh, everything under slash tickets will go to the tickets controller. Uh, so you, it's just basically one mapping, and then you you map the the rest of the path. If there's an ID, you do this. If there's no ID, that means that's the collection. So it's usually easier, technically speaking, uh, to just have plural forms for uh, your resources. And usually the, the uh, mental trick is to think of it as, you know, that's the, uh, the item, the 234th item, or item with that number of the tickets collection. So that's how I uh, mentally think about it and why I use the plural form. Then also about names, there's uh, how you, you write, you spell those names. So should you be, so in my examples, there was just uh, single words like repositories, cars, uh, etc. But uh, sometimes you have some more complex resources which are uh, made of, uh, let's say, two words. So should you be using camel casing or per perhaps snake casing? So there are different approaches. So, you know, uppercase camel case, lowercase camel case, snake case, or uh, I'm not sure it's called dashed snake case, but that's how I called it when you use hyphens instead of underscores. I've seen all of this, <laughs> uh, but it seems that there's a slight preference for lowercase forms and snake case. And uh, I, I found a study uh, on the net, I don't have the link handy, but the, I found a study which was explaining that using snake case was more readable than using camel case. Because, you know, it's like there's a, a space in between, so it reads more easily. So I don't know how they did their, their study, but that's uh, the, what they, they came up with in terms of conclusion. But at least whatever you choose, be sure to be consistent. So if you've chosen one casing, camel case, snake case, lower case, upper case, be sure to stick with that convention. Uh, don't have both uh, for different areas of your API. That wouldn't really feel uh, very good. When you deal with relations uh, in your URLs, uh, sometimes you can see URLs with, uh, let's say, tickets, one, two, three, messages, four. So sub-resources of your main resource. Um, sometimes you may be wondering, well, should that be a dedicated uh, message slash uh, for resource? Or should it be a sub-resource of the tickets uh, resource? And usually the, 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 the trick is to think in terms of whether uh, the, that sub-resource stands on its own. If it can be uh, uh, linked to, uh, without referring to uh, the ticket here, my message, uh, I could put it, uh, you know, uh, instead of under slash tickets, I could put it under just slash, slash messages for. But in this case, perhaps messages are only messages for one ticket. They cannot be for all their tickets, so it's okay to have that as a sub-resource in my path. But let's say for uh, groups of users, user groups, um, I think I would probably just, uh, although my user could be in this or that uh, particular group, it could be in several groups. So instead of saying users 67 of that user group, I would probably not use a sub-resource here, but instead uh, map directly and uh, uh, put directly slash users 67 rather than user groups. Under, under user groups. And if you do that uh, in the payload for your user group, you should be using a reference 
to that URL. But it will come back to uh, hypermedia links, etc. later on. Uh, and so I'll, I'll come back a little bit on that topic. Uh, <clears throat> API parameters, uh, some uh, rule of thumbs that I like to give. Uh, when, so in some of my examples, I was using some path uh, parameters. Uh, so slash, uh, so cars slash uh, 23. Uh, the ID of my car is part of the path, right? Uh, you could have thought, okay, I could have used uh, a query parameter, uh, question mark, ID equals uh, 42. Or uh, sometimes when you do request, request with bodies, you could pass that information through the body. And there's a fourth option, which is through a header. You can use uh, uh, HTTP headers to have those, uh, th th those parameters. So I, when I say parameters, it's whatever uh, customizes a certain uh, resource, let's say. So usually for a, um, so for a parameter which is actually identifying a resource, it's better to put it in the past, cars slash 23. If it's something that refines uh, or is optional or that refines, let's say, a query collection, like you want to filter a collection, then you should use a query parameter. When there's some more advanced logic going on, or if you want to send a search query, you would probably put that uh, in a body. But sometimes certain APIs can have both uh, a query string and a body, some support both. And the, the last one, uh, that's probably the one you would use the, the, the less frequent, frequently, is, is, it's when you pass headers. So things which are more global, let's say uh, if you've got an API key and you want to pass that as a header, but some APIs do pass it as a query parameter, so there's no real rule, but that's a kind of rule of thumb to decide what uh, to use and when. Um, yeah, a little uh, uh, focus now on HTTP status codes. Um, uh, you can have a look at this uh, short URL, bit.ly st code, like status code. It's uh, uh, with some of my colleagues. Let me see if I can show you that. With some of my colleagues, we made a, a little um, subway map. Uh, of HTTP status codes with uh, each family of status code is actually a, a metro, uh, a subway line. And there are some uh, funny uh, crossing stations like, you know, HTTP Central, Oath, Bazaar, etc. And when you hover some of the, uh, some of these um, status codes, you can see the, uh, what it's about. And you can also uh, click uh, to get to the, um, so let's say if I click on 507, it's going to uh, lead me to uh, the uh, the explanation of the this uh, status code. Okay, so let's get back to um, the status codes. So status codes, uh, ST code. If you want to have a look at that. So I said there are families of codes. So there's all the one X codes, the two X codes, etc. The one X code is usually, you know, hold on, uh, there's more to come. The two X code is, here you go, I've got your resource, I'm gonna um, give it to you. Three something, you know, that's redirections, etc. so just go away. Four X X, you fucked up, you, you used some bad, you know, query parameters or something. Five X X, it's I fucked up because my API is doing something wrong, you know, technical error occurred or something like that. That's a, or not just that, but rate limitation on other topics would be 5XX. And uh, there's a pretty cute uh, website called HTTP Status Dogs, which illustrate each HTTP status with cute pictures of dogs. So 100, continue. 200, everything is okay. 201, created, accepted. Non-authoritative information. Uh, no content, uh, yeah, nothing to eat today. 206 partial content, poor dog. And there's a, there are, there's one with cats, there's one with uh, rappers, uh, singers, and uh, I, I think there's a, a fourth one uh, in that in that same vein, illustrated, illustrating uh, HTTP status codes with uh, funny pictures. 
And sometimes you see APIs returning 200 all the time, but there's more than just 200. There are some useful 20x uh, codes, which are interesting. And I could, you know, put a finger on an anti-pattern, for instance, the, the Facebook API, which uses 200 for everything, even for errors. So everything is always okay, even if it's an error, which is not very restful, at least not, uh, it's not my taste. 200, let's say you, you post a new car, so the three dots, that's the, uh, the car I want to, uh, to create. Uh, I want to post a new car, create a new car. So instead of returning 200, I should actually use the proper HTTP status code, status code 201. That's a created resource. And it's important to pass the location, pointing at the, the locations of that newly created car. So cars go v2, car slash, that's the new, because I couldn't know the idea beforehand. Now, in, my, in the response I get from the API, I know where my newly created resource is located. So use the location header for that. Because API navigation is important to make API more discoverable. So when you play with an API, you learn to use it. It's nice to have, uh, not to have to uh, guess what the, 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 the URLs will be, but to actually get them and be able to navigate from one request to, to another. And that's why hypermedia that I'll mention la later on can also be interesting and important. And I'm going to make a small demo with the um, DHC API testing tool, if the network still works. So I've heard that there's a... Um, so it's not the movie we're going to watch tonight, unless uh, Stefan has got the, the scoop, but um, there's a, an API called the Star Wars API, right? So you don't have to wait for um, December um, to, to get some Star Wars fun. And this, uh, there, there's a Star Wars fan, an API fan, who created an API which lists all the, all the characters, all the, all the planets, all the movies, all the vehicles, spaceships, etc., all the species, etc. And for instance, if you do uh, swap pico API people one, you do a request and it's going, well, it's the result which is already displayed, but I could, let's say, do a, another one, people slash two, I don't know what's going to. Yeah. Probably Dark Vader, Dark Vader or some. No, this repo. So it's um, it's a nice API, and what's nice is that they they are actually using um, URLs to represent the the related resources. So if you want to know in which movies, in which films C C three PO was uh, part of, you can get the the film's property, and you'll see uh, you'll see that. And when you have some clever tools like uh, DHC, uh, you can do, so again, I'm going to do the, the query, but in, in that tool, uh, when your API is discoverable and is properly using links, uh, you can actually navigate those links. So here, uh, I was uh, looking at uh, Luke Skywalker, here, up, Luke Skywalker, is actually quite small, by the way, a bit heavy for this uh, <laughs> height, uh, and notice that the movies there, the films there, are actually hyperlink. And if I click on the hyperlink, it's going to prepare another request for that specific hyperlink, for that specific resource. So I can click it, and then I get, OK, the Force Awakens, this, uh, yeah, that's the, <laughs> the coming one uh, from December. And uh, perhaps if I continue, I'll find the, the scoop, what's happening to Luke Skywalker in Star Wars 7. I don't know. But yeah. Uh, having links makes API more easily discoverable. So let's continue with our status codes. Uh, accepted, sometimes there are some requests where the API cannot reply right away, like uh, returning uh, the payload directly. But you can say, okay, I accepted the request, but the treatment, uh, I'm going to process that later on asynchronously. So you might have to call me back or something like that. So you can say 202. You don't return uh, any pay payload, but later on you'll have to do another call to figure out where is this uh, this re request has gone. 204. If you delete uh, a resource uh, instead of saying 200 OK because the deletion worked, you can use 204 to say 
no content because you've just deleted that entity. But you might also see some APIs which actually do return 200 and return the, the payload of the resource, the representation of the resource that has just been deleted because you might still want to do something with that payload. So you can see both. But there's a proper status code for deletion. You can use to, well, not for deletion, but to express that there's no content anymore, at least, uh, under that resource. Partial content with 206. Let's say I want to list uh, all the meta rights, landings, and uh, I want to watch uh, page four. And instead of saying 200, you could say 206 partial content, because you're not, there are so many meta rights that you cannot return them all in one single uh, payload, in one single response. So instead, you're going to give just a, a small section of that collection. And you can also, uh, or you should also use the link header to say, okay, this is the first page, this is the previous, the next, the last page. That also helps navigating through the results. But uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back to pagination later on. Yes, there's a... Okay, I thought you were, you wanted to ask a question. Okay, no, no worries. So if you stretch, I might be thinking, you know, that you're, you want to ask some question. Um, in case of using caching, uh, instead of returning 200 and you give the payload, the, the representation, uh, you might be saying, okay, 304, uh, you already requested that resource, so I'm just saying, okay, it hasn't been notified, so you can use the one you have in cache already, instead of computing uh, and doing, a, you know, let's say a database access or something like that to get the resource. And speaking of caching, I'm just caching my... Uh, that's in my uh, math. Uh, last modified. So there are two. Uh, the, the most common approaches for that. There's the last modified header and e tag header. So let's say uh, I do a first get, and uh, I know it's been modified since that date. But then, uh, uh, so th I, I, uh, I, the. the the, the reply says, okay, the last modification date is this date. So it's uh, the, the number of seconds uh, of the epoch uh, time. Uh, so that you, you know when the last modification has been done. Uh, perhaps it's more, it will be clearer with the e-tag approach where, let's say, you do a get and you knew that the, the resource, you, you had a, uh, the version of that resource with that identifier, A, 4, 5, blah, blah, blah. But then you get the, the, the content, uh, things, has, has, things have changed, and you get a new version of that resource, and you've got a new e-tag for that. And then the next time, okay, I'm going to do another get because I, I want to see if there's, uh, there's an update for it. I could also use a, a head call instead of a get uh, in case the, 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 the payload is huge. Uh, but that would mean potentially doing two calls instead of one. And then I get another time with the, that same identifier that I had discovered the last time uh, for the previous call. And then it's telling me three or four not modified because that's the same one the same one I got uh, the previous time. So let's come back a little bit to pagination. So I mentioned the uh, discoverability, uh, the link header, etc. There are often different ways of doing pagination. Um, so either using a page number or a limit offset uh, approach. So you say, okay, um, I want page 23 of uh, my uh, meta rights. Uh, and you can also sometimes specify the size of the page and the number of items returned uh, for, for each page. Uh, the tricky, the downside of this approach is that uh, if you've got an insertion going on, um, there might be a, you know, a slight difference uh, between the pages, perhaps some overlap or if, uh, if something was deleted or inserted a novel app or some elements missing when you are navigating. So that's a drawback of this approach. There's a, another approach which is using cursors so that once you've moved at a certain point into that collection, uh, you, you're going to continue from that point. Uh, whether something was deleted or inserted before doesn't really matter because you're going to continue after that cursor point. And there was a, an interesting article that I read um, a few months ago, but 
what I would call, let's say, semantic parameters. When, when there's a limited number uh, or a discrete number of pages, let's say uh, only you, you, you um, make uh, bunches of pages, uh, you regroup the entities, the, the resources, by the first letter of their name or something like that. Or let's say you've got only uh, five categories of something. Uh, you could decide to do pagination uh, across those uh, special semantic meanings. But usually if there's a, you know, any number of possible elements, uh, that's also a drawback because perhaps you, you would actually be doing a, a first filter operation and then do the usual pagination instead of uh, doing that. But that was a, an interesting idea that I wanted to mention. So it's not one I'm seeing very often, but uh, it's an interesting idea. And another approach, instead of using query parameters, you can also use uh, the, the, the range header. Uh, often ranges, accept ranges, is usually used for bytes. So let's say you're retrieving um, you know, a big picture or something like that. You can retrieve the picture in chunks and say, OK, I've already downloaded that part, so I want to download that part of the, the big uh, binary resource. But you can also create your own ranges. And uh, you can specify, OK, so um, here I do a first call uh, for the list of users, and it's telling me, OK, uh, I accept the range users, and then what's returned for that first call is actually the range, the, the first 10 items of my users. Uh, and there are 200 items. And the next call I could make, I could say, okay, now I want range uh, 10 to 19, etc., using headers instead of query parameters. So that's quite elegant, but I'm not seeing that used much often. When returning collections of things, so it's not necessarily um, a DevOps sandwich, although that one might uh, look tasty. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that's nasty. <laughs> I'm glad I had my sandwich this uh, noon. Uh, so wrapped collections. Uh, sometimes you see APIs which return, so especially when, it, uh, when we're speaking about JSON, even more so than uh, other uh, formats, XML, etc. Uh, sometimes, although you're just returning a list of something, you're not using the, the, ob the, the JSON uh, array, array concept you're using. A wrapper JSON object within which there's a property which contains an array of uh, here tickets. Okay. I mean, it's a bit of a useless additional boilerplate that you have here uh, because uh, you don't necessarily need that, uh, you know, uh, curly brace data, etc. You could just return directly the, uh, the object, uh, the, the array, sorry, the JSON array. Um, that said, when, there's, uh, when there are some specific items, uh, uh, no, specific metadata about the collection, let's say you are um, uh, getting uh, a collection of pictures, an album, you, your album might uh, have a title, location, some date, etc. So these are particular to that collection. So it's not just a paging information, like this is the first page of uh, my uh, list of pictures, no. So when there's real metadata associated to that collection of things, then it makes sense to have wrapped collections. But otherwise, my feeling is that uh, it's better to use directly uh, a JSON array rather than a wrapped uh, array inside a JSON object. Okay, let's move on to the three X codes moved permanently, found, see other, not modified, <laughs> temporary redirect, permanent redirect. Uh, so nothing specific to say about the three X codes. So that's usually, you know, when things have moved, uh, resources moved location, so you can use those codes. Now, the, the codes where users made an error, so bad request, unauthorized, forbidden because you don't have the right to do that operation, uh, not found, <laughs> no bones to be found. Uh, another uh, DevOps sandwich, <laughs> if you're not a vegan or vegetarian. 
And uh, uh, too many requests. So let's say uh, you, you are using an API like, um, I don't know, the GitHub API or something like that, and you've hit uh, the rate limitations. We'll come back to rate li limitations later on. Uh, you can also get a 429, too many requests have been issued. And speaking of 4x, uh, so usually that's because there are some errors going on. Um, it's good to uh, not just return, uh, you know, uh, four, or four or four, four or three or whatever, but it's good to be able, um, uh, you know, it's good to be able to, to describe more precisely what this error is about. So something is forbidden, not necessarily because you have not the right to do something, uh, like the, you know, in terms of authorization. Uh, but actually here it's more, uh, you know, banking authorization here. Uh, I, I cannot do a, a, a transfer or, or debit because I don't have enough uh, on my account. And then you can describe what's uh, there. So you could give a title, you can give some details, the instances uh, on which the problem was occurring and potentially other details. And uh, there's no standard for that, but there are proposals like the VND error mime type or the HTTP problem proposal, which might become an RFC. And this one is the HTTP problem approach. Also notice the, um, the plus JSON stuff, if, you've not, if you're not familiar with that. It's uh, to say, OK, this is a special content type, but I want to have a JSON representation for that resource, for that uh, content type. So you, you'll see plus JSON, plus YAML, plus XML, etc. For the 5x, uh, uh, internal server error, <laughs> not implemented, service unavailable, bandwidth exceeded. Also something interesting when you're a client, when you're a consumer of an API, uh, if there's an, um, an, uh, an error code that as a client you don't understand, let's say 499, I don't think that it exists, but you should be treating it as if it were a 400. Uh, 518, I'm a teapot, you don't know what to do about that error code, just treat it as if it's a server error uh, in terms of you know, what you're going to display in the UI of your application or mobile app or something like that. Just treat that, uh, it's part of the, um, the uh, HTTP RFCs that you should treat unknown status codes as the, the zero, zero error uh, status code of the, the status code family. So, rate limitation, uh, so 429, too many uh, uh, requests, for instance. Uh, you'll see APIs uh, using those headers, X rate limit. So it's, uh, it's not a standard, but it's uh, quite uh, used commonly uh, on various APIs, the GitHub API or other APIs I've seen in the wild. In the wild. So you can say you can give the number of total requests that are allow allowed, the remaining uh, that you're allowed to make, and also when that rate limitation will be lift. So the next time I'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, once you've reached zero, the next time I'm going to be able to make new requests so that you don't make requests when you don't have the right uh, to do so because you've exceeded the limit. So if you add rate limitation because you want to, you know, your API is so successful that you have to limit uh, customers to access it. You can use those quite uh, common uh, HTTP headers. Um, one size doesn't necessarily fit all, and you may uh, provide different payloads for different consumers. For instance, uh, let's say uh, you want to select just uh, a subset of uh, restaurants, so it's, m it's more about filtering, if you will. Uh, so you can say, okay, I want the Chinese restaurants with five stars. But uh, for filtering, uh, you can also say that the payload, let's say uh, I'm retrieving the user details, uh, my user might have tons of information about, you know, not just first name, last name, and, you know, address and whatever, but perhaps uh, my user is a very heavy object, okay? 
But in my, let's say, in my mobile application, I'm really only interested in the first name, last name, and age that I want to, to display in my uh, mobile view. So I could use this approach of saying, uh, with using a query parameter, fields equals first name, last name, age, because that's I want the payload, but I just want to get those properties, not all the rest of the payload of the representation. You could also say exclude, because I want to exclude certain fields I'm not in interested in. Uh, and the other one, which uh, I find quite in interesting, it's um, you could also decide that there are different profiles, different styles, uh, let's say a, a mobile view of uh, my user or a full view of my user, etc. You could define one, two, three uh, buckets or uh, how to say that? Uh, yeah, styles. Uh, I don't. I don't think there's a, a common term for that. I came up with style. But there's also another approach which is not very well known. It's using the prefer header. This one is. In my opinion, more elegant. So you can, diff uh, yeah, here I, I use the term profile instead of style. So choose your uh, naming. Uh, let's say different profiles. So a minimal profile, a mobile profile, a, a full profile, because I want to see all the details. And uh, when I do get, I say I want to, to do a get. So I do the, the get, and it's telling me, OK, I've re I've, the, the API returned the minimal profile. Uh, but in the very header, I know that uh, the, the API accept that prefer header, and then I'm able to say, um, so in the uh, in the, uh, the 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 reply that I get, the preference that was applied was minimal because I, I, I requested uh, here I asked for the yeah sorry I'm saying it wrong I asked for the minimal profile and then yeah the preference that was applied was the minimal profile, okay? So that's a way, because different consumers, different um, clients, uh, mobile apps versus web apps might not need the same information. So you, instead of letting the client decide which fields he wants to get, uh, you could, uh, in terms of, uh, so it's more, in con the, the, the control is on the API implementer side of things. You could say, okay, I support three profiles. These are the profiles you can use as a consumer. Uh, sometimes resources depend on other resources, so a user might depend on, on a, uh, has a, a more uh, a deeper model, uh, the, the user has got an address, an address has got a zip code, a country, etc. So sometimes or often you see uh, users with just the top level properties, but then you've got references to uh, the the, the sub-resources, and if you really want to customize and get uh, the, uh, the the whole address, you could say, just like we were filtering on fields, you could say instead of just address, address.zip, because you also want the zip code inside the address. So it's a way of expanding all the resources or sub-resources which are um, part of that uh, user. Then, so we spoke also about filtering, pagination, etc. You can uh, sort your uh, collections. So there are different approaches. So there's the, the SQL, what I call the SQL style, where, where you say SOAR equals title plus desk, because you, you want to desk in descending order on the title, or you can put uh, you know, two uh, sorts. Uh, there are also APIs which do uh, two query parameters, one for the sort column or property, and then desk and or ask for descending or ascending order. But sometimes you, you could see also sort and order. So sort, order equals ask or desk. But if you do that, you can't have one field uh, descending and the other field ascending. So depending on how you want your users to sort through your data, you might be preferring one over the other. Uh, but again, there's no real standard for that, so it's more, uh, you know, uh, your own taste. Searching, uh, yeah, very briefly, we've seen different ways of filtering things. Um, <clears throat> so you can do simple searches on one particular resource uh, with that approach, but sometimes there are APIs which also provide a, a much richer 
query uh, system. And in that case, you know, it could be a SQL-like language, it could be a, a JSON kind of uh, tree or something like that. Uh, so again, there's no real standard there. Now, uh, versioning. Versioning your APIs. So V1, that, that was a, a flying bomb from uh, World War II, a German uh, flying bomb. So it's not the, the version. So there are different, again, different approaches to API versioning. The one I see most frequently in the uh, APIs that we see uh, at Restlet, uh, and that we also support in our own API platform, by the way, it's using the uh, the version in the URL itself. So it's uh, v2 slash restaurants, etc. So the the very beginning of the uh, the path uh, corresponds to uh, the um, the version of your API. Another approach is to use a custom header. So in the header, uh, it's not a standard, but I've seen several APIs with that uh, notation. X API key, X API version, etc. So X API version would say, I want to get the restaurant with the V2 of my API. And the other one which is interesting uh, is with the uh, accept header where you use that uh, notation, vnd restaurants dot v2 plus json. Uh, if you look at the, the GitHub API, for example, they are using uh, such an approach. Uh, if you're not using an accept header, it's going to return the latest API. But if you're still stuck for a little while uh, with the old API before mov moving to the new one, you can specify, OK, I want v2 uh, with the accept header with that uh, special media type. And uh, hypermedia. Um, so it's a big topic. It could be uh, we could spend an hour, a full hour on uh, hypermedia. So we al already spoke a little bit. There's kind of Star Wars theme in that uh, presentation. Uh, we spoke a little bit about the nice aspects of using hyperlinks to navigate between resources. Uh, that makes the API more discoverable. And uh, it's easier uh, once you get, uh, let's say, a user and you want to get the list of friends of that user, you get directly the URLs of, that, of those users. Uh, it, it makes the API easier to navigate. And um, uh, I don't remember when that was, a few years ago, um, Leonard Richardson defined a, a maturity model for uh, how restful an API can be. So the first level was just exchanging uh, plain old XML, and you could have uh, get users in the in the path, etc. Then you go with nouns and resources. Then you've got users, cars, etc. Uh, but then perhaps your API was just using get and post, but not delete and uh, and put. Then the, the other level with HTTP verbs, now you use the proper HTTP verbs. And then the best level, level three, you use hypermedia control with links uh, to the, the related resources. Uh, there are some pros and cons for hypermedia. Uh, what's interesting with, uh, so sometimes people uh, sell <laughs> hypermedia because, oh yeah, you can escape the versioning, API versioning hell. Because uh, if there are new linked resources, you can just add new links in, in the payload. Or uh, let's say the, um, uh, I don't have a good example in mind, let's say the users, uh, the way you get the, um, the, the friends of a sudden user is done through a sudden uh, resource, uh, but then uh, in the next version of your API, you're dealing friends very differently. And then you can add a new link to the new way of how getting friends for a certain user. So you could make versioning more transparent without defining v1, v2, v3, because the API change, change a little bit or uh, wider. But I don't think it works for all possible changes because sometimes changes are really too far reaching and uh, just changing links won't be enough to support uh, the, the new version of the API. Um, 
Uh, another pro is that it makes uh, APIs more generic in the sense that uh, clients who are able to navigate those resources could discover the new links and then help you navigate to those links. But for me, the, the, the con there is that there's uh, some semantics associated with uh, a link. So if, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a mobile device, uh, I'm using your API, and there's a, a, there's a new link called friends. Uh, okay, uh, what is that concept Concept of friends? I, I don't know what it is. How to represent that in my mobile app UI? So, uh, in terms of, I mean, uh, uh, even if a client of a certain API, a consumer of an API can discover those links, you might not necessarily know uh, what this new link is about because there's semantics associated with that hypermedia link and you'll have to evolve the, the mobile application to uh, get uh, a good understanding on how to represent this uh, new link in, uh, in this new hypermedia link in the payload that is returned. Also another uh, downside is that uh, well, the more links you have, the heavier the payload. So, uh, especially you know, on your mobile device. Like, so I, w I took the. I only arrived uh, to Devox uh, uh, at noon, and uh, I came from Paris with the Thales train, and I was using my uh, mobile phone for tethering, because the uh, onboard Wi-Fi doesn't always work, and the connectivity wasn't all that great, even you know, at uh, full speed on the train. And uh, the heavier the payload, the harder you know, the interaction and how smooth your mobile app is going to be because uh, you might spend 10 seconds to get a result because of all these additional links. So the app is less responsive because uh, the payload has he are, are much heavier. So think about that, but also you can think again about things like the, the prefer header that I talked about yet, uh, er earlier on. Because you could say that, okay, I'm on a mobile device, so I don't want to have all the hypermedia information uh, in the payload. So I could just say I'm using the mobile profile or no hypermedia profile or something like that. So that's the a list of pros and cons for hypermedia APIs. But keep in mind that change is unavoidable uh, because the, the API might be changing drastically and uh, hypermedia won't be the answer in all the possible cases. For implementing hypermedia, there's a lot of choice. Uh, so there are different competing uh, uh, proposals or uh, projects and uh, ways of doing hypermedia. HAL is perhaps the, the most well-known. There's JSON LD, Collections plus JSON, Siren, and quite a few others. So those ones are the, the, the most, let's say, the most popular ones. Uh, so I'll, I'll just, um, uh, yeah, so I should have put that um, later on. Um, just before, so I'm going to mention Hal in a, in, a, in, a, in a few slides. Just a few words about IDs in, in your linked resources. If you don't go with Hal, JSON LD, et cetera, and if you do your own hypermedia using links directly without using those uh, standard approaches. Be sure to actually put uh, URLs, not just the IDs. Let, let's say I've got a list of photos in an album. Uh, I want to get the list, uh, it should be inside uh, strings, inside uh, quotes, I mean. Uh, you want to have uh, the links to the photos, not just the IDs of the photos. Because the, uh, I mean, the, the client would need to figure out what the URL of the uh, of the photo, which is kind of error prone if you make a, a change, or if the URIs are changing a little bit uh, when you evolve the API, uh, so it's more resilient, uh, it's more solid if you go with URLs uh, for IDs instead of just the, the, the ID. And another word about IDs is that usually it's better to use, so although it's a in all my slides, I used counter types uh, of IDs, one, two, three, four, etc. But usually it's better to use UUIDs uh, because uh, two benefits we could list uh, about that is that uh, 
you know, uh, uh, hackers uh, might not as easily guess the related resources uh, or find new resources that it, they shouldn't have access to. And the other aspect is that depending on how you deal with uh, the generation of IDs, but in distributed systems, an API which is on several nodes, etc., depending on how you implemented it, using auto-incrementing IDs, uh, you might have you know, problems with IDs which are not unique depending on the node you hit, and you've got two calls generating the same IDs and things like that. So UUIDs are usually better than just pure counter IDs. So let's get back to one example of hypermedia with how. So I'm sorry, Dave. I'm sorry, Dave. I can do hypermedia with a <laughs> soft voice. Uh, so this is one approach. Uh, here, let's say I'm looking at some uh, player, um, and um, the, the the so I'm just showing one aspect of HAL, uh, but there are more than uh, just that uh, link. So there's a special links property where you can uh, define the links. There's a self link uh, pointing at yourself, the the current resource. But you can also define links, let's say, okay, to the friends of that player, uh, again with the full URL, so that you can easily navigate. But there's more to that in the, the HAL approach. But if you want to follow one approach in your API, you could use that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we're reaching uh, the end. Re uh, there are some useful resources that I'm putting there, but there are many more uh, interesting links on the topic of API design. So, uh, the, well, the video will be online later on, and I'll put the slides uh, uh, later on if you follow me on Twitter, GLAForge. Uh, I'll put a link to, to the slides. And I think that's all. So thanks a lot for your attention. And I think we just have, so I don't see the counter, uh, but I think we have uh, two minutes, right? Two, uh, three minutes for a few questions. Yes, over there in the middle. So the query parameters, uh, repeated query parameters. Uh, I don't hear you very well, and I'm not sure I understand the question. So say it much louder. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So how to do that? You mean? Okay. Yeah, is it a good approach? I usually like when you separate with commas. You know. Player A uh, or player equals uh, A comma B comma C etc. I, I tend to prefer that style, but mm, yeah, I'm not sure. There's a not sure what's the the most frequent uh, thing. Yeah. Yes, in the front. What do you think about matrix parameters? Matrix parameters, like what kind of metrics do you mean? Matrix. Oh, matrix, matrix. matrix. Matrix parameters. Uh, what kind of matrix w you would have? Okay. Okay. So the query parameters might be referencing the top resource or sub resources. Yeah. Okay. So how to select which resource or sub-resource does the query parameter applies to? So if you use the, you know, the dot notation approach, like let's say you want to get uh, player dot, or like uh, the example I gave with a city, uh, no, a user with an address, with a zip code, etc. That's a, a way to, you know, access particular aspects of sub-resources. So I would probably go with that. So I'm not sure that's uh, your question. No. Because, no, okay. It's a little bit difficult when you don't know the concept. Okay, so okay. let's talk about it uh, after so that you can better explain uh, yeah. the, the context. 
Okay, I think, uh, are we good or still one more or we're good? So we are good. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention and uh, don't hesitate to come to me for further questions. Thanks.